The visuals you choose in telling your story is essential to craft an intentional experience for your audience. Each scene is made up of shots to build coverage to edit together a final scene. And there is a language to film. And if we think of it in terms of actual language, then we could think of a scene like a sentence. In this case, shots would be words. Coverage would be the collection of those words that we've chosen to use to form that sentence. And editing would be the organization of those words to form the final coherent and hopefully emotionally impactful sentence. And we're gonna get into coverage in next week's episode, but before we can build our sentence, we have to first understand all of the words we can choose from. So today we're gonna look at the main shot types you can use for your film. To do this, we're going to talk about five main things I consider when thinking about shots. Shot size, angle, framing, movement, and focal length. But let's first jump to shot size. Now we're going to start wide and work our way in, first up with the extreme wide shot. Or on a shot list, it might be seen as EWS. This shot, like most of these, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a shot that is far from the subject, taking in the entirety of the environment. This could be anything from a shot of an entire planet down to a city or a massive pullback of the actual scene. You see extreme wides in every type of film, but they are used a lot to great effect in epics, films with a massive scope that want the world to feel huge, like Blade Runner or Lord of the Rings, for instance. You'll see these shots conveying the amount of space our heroes need to travel or the scope of a battle. Then we get a little closer with the wide shot or WS on a shot list. Here, your subject is a bit more in focus, but we're still pulled back. They're not filling the frame. Sticking with Lord of the Rings, the Two Towers has some gorgeous wide shots of Gollum. Or we could look at some of the gorgeous wide shots from Blade Runner 2049, like this one here. This beautiful silhouette of Kay walking home. We get a good amount of the environment, but still feel the character pretty well. All the shots after this, your subject becomes more dominant, filling the frame. First with the full shot or FS. This is still wide taking in a lot of the surroundings, but your subject will fill the entire frame head to toe or top to bottom if it's an object. Then we move in just a touch with the medium wide shot or MWS. Usually the feet are cut off, so we are no longer seeing our character head to toe. We've moved in enough that their entire body is no longer visible at once. Moving in a little further, we have the cowboy shot. It's called the cowboy because it comes from Westerns, where the shot was designed to include the cowboy's holstered gun. So it's from the head to a little below the hips, which really this could be thrown in to the medium wide category, which is what I always call it. I've never actually called for a cowboy shot, but in case anyone does, now you know. Next up, we have the medium shot or the MS. This is around hips up. We're all torso now. Definitely one of the most used shot sizes. You still get a sense of the environment and the character's body language, but you are getting more into their eyes, which lets you more into their thoughts and to get more intimate with them. Continuing closer, we have the medium close up or MCU. This is around chest up. We're getting even more intimate now. It's all about the subject's face, their expressions, the nuance of their performance. A lot of dialogue scenes live in this space. But let's make it even more about the character and move to our close-up, or CU. With this, the focus of our shot is completely filling the frame. For a character, that is often their face. We are in there with them, completely intimate. It's an intense shot that brings you in to emphasize something important. Because of that, it's used sparingly. But this doesn't have to be just a face. Of course, you can have a close-up of a hand, a prop, and so on. Whatever that focus is. Then getting even more extreme, we come to the extreme close-up, or ECU. And it's exactly what you would think. We are extremely close to whatever the focus is. If it's a face, then we might be very close to the eyes or just the mouth. One of my favorite ECUs comes from Seven, where on his eyes and his reading glasses are reflecting the pages in front of him. It's such an elegant way to shoot that moment. And like the close-up, this could be of anything, not just a face. And that is your standard list of sizes. Of course, there's more, but that's the basics. But before we move on to angles, I want to thank today's partner, and that is Filmora 10. Filmora 10 is an easy to use editing software that is also really low cost. I have heard a lot of you guys talking about how you're unhappy with subscription models. And while this does have a subscription model for the software, you can also buy it outright, which is a really big plus. It's really solid software too. Super intuitive and packed full of everything you need like multiple video tracks and civilization capabilities and so on, all built right in. And there's other great additions too, like motion tracking, keyframing, audio ducking, and really solid color 
color matching. You have your reference, hit one button, and there you go. Then there's great additions for social media work like auto reframing. This can smart crop your videos so you can make your alts quickly for all the different platforms. Then great split screen templates to dive into different styles really easily. The ability to import from your photo library and support for HEVC, which is really nice to have when working with footage from your Apple devices. And of course, it's just really solid editing software as well. So if you're looking to dive into editing software that won't break the bank, definitely check this out. It's really good and easy to use. I wrap my head around this thing just after 15 minutes of using it. So check out the notes below for more on Filmora 10. For me, your angle is your camera's position relative to the subject of the shot in question. So most angles can have any of the shot sizes and vice versa. For the first one, we have an angle that usually would be in a wide or an extreme wide, and that's a bird's eye view. This shot is right overhead. One of my favorite instances of this is from David Fincher's Zodiac as the camera follows the car through the streets. Now, if you come a little closer, you'll usually hear this one called an overhead. Again, this is right above the subject, but the subject is more in focus. Now, if we shift from being directly overhead, you have high angle. This is anything above eye level or what would be assumed to be base level for whatever the subject is. Thematically, this is often used to make something feel lesser, weaker, smaller, and so on. Opposite of that, we of course have our low angle. And if the high angle pushes the idea of weakness, this one will give your character strength. This angle makes the subject larger, dominant in frame. Again, this is below the eye line and it could be anything from very subtle to extreme. Then you have the Dutch angle. This is when your horizon is off, with some of my favorite examples coming from the films of Brian De Palma. It's a great way to make the world feel a bit or a lot off. And then you have the POV, which stands for point of view. Now, there are two versions of this, the implied and the literal. The implied POV is when your character looks in a direction, then you show what they're looking at. We're seeing what they are seeing, so it's their point of view, but it's not necessarily through their eyes. Then with the literal, you are actually seeing what the character is seeing from their eyes. You see this a lot in horror films, especially those from the 70s and the 80s, like Raimi's famous monster cam shots, or E.T.'s perspective from Spielberg's film. Like shots, there are more angles, but those are the basics I want to talk about. But now let's move on to framing. Now framing is really a collection of things. It's the composition of your frame. How you frame a subject for me encompasses everything. But for our purposes today, I want to talk about just four basic things. First is if your frame is clean or dirty, meaning are you looking at the subject without anything in between your lens and that subject? Or like we see all through Gareth Edwards' Godzilla, do you have elements in your foreground between you and that subject? Similarly, you have overs or over the shoulder shots. You'd also see this on a shot list as OTS. This is when you are looking over one character's shoulder at another. It's a very common thing to see inside of dialogue scenes. Then we have a single, which is when just one character is in frame. Then a two shot, which is when you have two characters in frame. You may see this as 2S on your shot list. But now let's go to movement. For this, I'm gonna brush over it pretty quickly because we have a full episode all about movement that you can find in the notes below, but let's cover the basics. First is the pan, which is moving the camera on a horizontal axis from left to right or right to left. Then the tilt, which is moving the camera on the vertical axis up and down. Then we have a dolly move, which is when your move employs the use of a camera dolly, often on tracks. Some of the greatest dolly shots can be seen in Spielberg films. The way the man uses the dolly is just straight up musical. Next is the zoom, which can move us toward a subject or away like a dolly, but with a much different feel with the background staying static. Then we have tracking, which is just tracking with the subject, like a walk and talk. 1917 is pretty much just one long tracking shot. Then we have the crane shot or boom shot. This is the smooth vertical movement by way of a crane, jib, or boom arm on a dolly. These can be great for establishing shots, dramatic reveals, or big punctuations. Again, if you want to dive more into movement, check out the episode in the notes below. And our last factor is the focal length. Now this is a bit more of a subjective thing. It's something that will alter depending on what you want your audience to feel, but your focal length will change the feel of your shot quite a bit. For instance, a close-up of an actor's face on a long focal length, meaning more zoomed in, is going to feel completely different than a close-up on a wide angle or zoomed out. The Revenant has a lot of close-ups in wide angle. This sort of lens will elongate the face, maybe distort, and give more of an uncomfortable feel, 
whereas a longer lens will compress the face and maybe give it more of an attractive view. And that idea of compression goes to the background as well. If we shoot Josh here with a close up at 24 millimeter versus 105 millimeters, you can see how different that background is going to feel in these two shots. The wider lens will open up the world while the longer lens will close it in, make it more claustrophobic or just wash it away and make it all about that character in your shot. But that is an overview of the basic things that make up a shot for me. Of course, there is one other important factor that you would decide on before you ever got to any of that, and that's aspect ratio. We may do an episode all about aspect ratio in the future, but the aspect ratio you choose will completely alter the way your composition will feel or work entirely from the more squared look to the wide. Why you would choose one over the other varies, but it's mostly subjective. Though Spielberg did choose a more open 185 aspect ratio since he wanted more height for the dinosaur, so that was a practical and obvious choice for that subject matter. But then again, even the depth of field you choose or filter you may have on your lens is going to change how it all feels. So we definitely could keep going, but we're gonna leave it at that for now, the basic tools for constructing your scene. Or to go back to my early analogy, the basic words you have to construct your sentence. Now next week, we're gonna get into using these tools to put together our scene. But until then, if you aren't subscribed, consider doing so and hit the bell so you're notified when we put up new content. You can also find our social media links below and link to the gear that we use to make this show, but that is it. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.